Welcome to another edition of Throwing Out Some Heavy Light. My name is Ajamal Bynum and the chair of the board of MORE, which stands for Movement in Omaha for Race Equity. Uh, we have a special show tonight, and I'm really excited to be able to host this event so that we can talk about some of the issues that we have not addressed uh, in our popular uh, culture and sometimes in our popular media uh, in the community. We have a guest today. His name is Trip Reynolds. He's a community member with extensive background in many areas, such as human resources. He worked in major corporations. And most of us know him from his work that he did at Cox Cable 22 uh, many years ago. As I said, he has a human resources background, also in communication background, and he's developed a web page focused on issues impacting African Americans uh, in the community and obviously in the state. I invite him to talk about his robust library of past editorials and topics that he's shared in the media regarding the challenges that we face as African Americans, uh, and particularly in our community. I initially came in contact with Tripp when he was running or in charge of Channel 22 some years ago, that cable program that brought a lot of uh, frank conversations to our community and it allowed people to talk about various issues without censorship and so on in, in, in our community. This program uh, will explore his latest views on Wakanda and its implications dealing with Juconda, uh, and there is a symbolism in that, and we must explore some of these issues if we want to transform our community. As Dave Chappelle remarked, we must respect the artists and those with creative minds to help us understand reality and avoid white censorship. We will talk about buffoons, institutions, Uncle Tom's, the lynchings of African Americans, the empowerment network, religion, and other issues that have been swept under the institutional rug in communities of the press. Uh, we hope that you can enjoy this program. And of course, if you want to find out more about Mr. Trip Reynolds' um, uh, work and so on, you can go to his webpage where he has Trip, we'll have it listed in there, but Trip or uh, Poetry and so on, and some of his other links uh, related to some of his comments. Uh, we, this will be hopefully, as we call it, a controversial program, but also, we, as we said, we like, we'll pull back the sheets on the butt naked empires in our emperors in our community and the sacred cows that we oftentimes don't talk about in this plantation environment. Uh, and then we have, uh, will hopefully give an opportunity to re raise many questions with Trip, and then, of course, halfway through the program, we'll let the audience uh, participants uh, talk directly to him. So, well, without much further ado, Trip, welcome to throwing out some heavy light. And I always start off Trip with my guests to say, can you share briefly just a little bit about yourself, and we'll get right into the questions. So, Trip Reynolds. Okay. Um, let, I'll just let me hit something first, um, uh, just for general information purposes. I don't consider myself African American. I consider myself Black, and there's a big difference between the two. I noticed years ago when, like I was living in, in Chicago and I attended the Black Arts Festival and there was nothing Black about it. It was all African stuff. Absent was information on what I'll call Black Arts like Sam Davis Jr., Ella Fitzgerald. So it's, it's not that I have uh, something against Africa, but there's a big difference between being African, which is an entire continent, and Black which is an entirely different persona that is native to particularly this, our experience here. So that's just one thing. Um, I'm, a, I'm a brat of the Midwest. I was, uh, I'll just put it this way. I was born in St. Louis the very year, then Lincoln, Nebraska for about uh, nine years, Lincoln, Nebraska to Wichita, Kansas, Wichita, Kansas to Chicago, Chicago to Dallas, Dallas to Denver, and then most recently in the last mm -hmm. 10 years or so to Omaha. My, I could bring up some slides, but I'm, I'm not gonna do, do that. But let me just kind of give you an overview. Uh, in my experience, I went from early on in my experience being uh, attending integrated schools. And then that was in Nebraska and Lincoln. This, so we're talking the early 60s, then moving to Kansas, the schools are segregated. And I, and I asked my parents, uh, actually, when we, my mom and dad, they sit us down in the, in the kitchen and they said, boys, now the school you're going to be going to, which is directly across the street, there aren't any white kids there. And so I said, what happened to the white kids? And, 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 and my dad said, well, it's segregated. I never heard that term before. Um, and then, so this is 63. Then a year later, Civil Rights Act was passed, 64. And so my parents took us out of the all black school directly across the street 
And they actually yeah. drove three miles to a white school out in the suburbs and took us there. And an entirely different experience. Uh, I'll say probably but humbly, my grades never changed, but my older and younger brothers, their grades, they, they just went down the tubes. Um, and I learned some things very early on in my life about uh, how the race card is played, uh, whether intentionally or unintentionally. And, and, and I'll, I'll end on this note here. Um, uh, when I was in high school, uh, this is at the, this is after Martin Luther King was assassinated. And there, supposedly there was a riot at my high school. There really wasn't a riot. What happened was there was a fight that broke out that happened in the lunchroom between a white girl and a black girl. Uh, but because it was a white girl and a black girl, um, some people perceived it was a riot. It wasn't. And so the, the assistant principal called the county sheriff to come out. And the county sheriff didn't ask questions, just started beating heads. Um, now, at lunchtime, most people that were out and about at lunch outside were black students playing basketball. <laughs> so, I have a lot of questions. Let me see if I can get to if we can. Yeah, but, I get to them. but just but but my point here is this. So uh, I get arrested for defending a black girl from being beaten by the police. And so there are 14 um, students arrested. Of the 14, I was the only one released. And my dad, uh, when I get out, my dad says to me, Trip, you're the only one out. And you're the only one that's not going back. All the other, your friends, they have black lawyers. I had a white Jewish lawyer. Do you understand? Okay. okay. Well, I, I'm gonna so that's my go. orientation. Beg your pardon? So that's what I'm saying to you. That's my orientation of- okay. <laughs> Of seasoning about how things have changed. So, but anyway, go to your questions, though. Yeah, I, I have a rapid list of questions I'm getting. Also, we only have a certain, so the guests are going to ask you also a question. Yeah. Basically, in the open part, we talked a little about the issues related to narrative about Wakanda and Jukanda. It's a metaphor, I think, that deals with genocide, oppression, and the past of enslavement of Black folks. Spell out why do you use that term, Jukanda and Wakanda? What do you mean by that? Okay. So I wrote, some people, I, they consider that controversial. And if you could also be brief, we move to the next one. A lot of people were so impressed with Black Panther. Um, but unfortunately, people don't want to do the due diligence to find out how Black Panther, the origins of Black Panther, the, the comic book and everything else. And so in the story, okay, so we have, it's, it's kind of like Romulus and Remus. So in the story we have, and this was in the film, the, there's two brothers and one went to the United States to help during the civil rights movement. His brother said, you can't do this, you need to leave. And so he gets killed in the United States for trying to help black people uh, uh, exert their, their freedom. So I want you to think about this now. So we have, a, we have a situation where the most advanced civilization on the planet, black people, they have better technology, better weaponry than anybody else. And they had within their means to actually conquer the entire world, but they didn't. Instead, they stayed, they stayed hidden in some small little of uh, uh, Wakanda, all right? Now let's flip the switch. What if during World War II, there was this hidden civilization of Jewish people that had all this technology and they sat and did nothing while the Holocaust was occurring? Where's that movie? You see the, you see the, you see the comparison? Where's right. that movie, okay? And, uh, and so uh, despite all the success that the Black Panther film made and the comic book, okay? Who really got paid? Did black people get any of that revenue? No, Disney did. <laughs> and gotcha. so no. it's, it's just the same old, same old thing. We, I've seen this movie time and time and time again. Some people don't want to hold, don't want to raise attention to it, but that's the, what I consider a very deceitful way of getting black people again to, to go along to get along. Hey, we paid you. For making buffoons of yourself, and but we're going to get all the money. 
Got you. I'm going to switch up on you. You you wrote, uh, I would say, probably a number of months ago, an open letter to the city council, uh, the mayor, and you raised many points related to uh, buffoonery, the Uncle Tomism, the anti-mama behaviors, in a sense. And at one of the city council's meeting, I know that Britt Harding uh, took offense to something that you wrote and read it, I guess, into the records. Did he ever respond to your comments and the merits no. of what you raised in that correspondence? No, he did not. And I didn't expect him to. Unfortunately, the, not unfortunately, here's the deal about everything I write. And it's posted with, in, the, in, the, in the editorials I write. I write based on facts, okay? It's not my opinion, it is a fact that when he was assisting Hal Dub, there was a police, robust police uh, study that before Hal Dub, during Hal Dub's administration, afterwards, okay? And so um, there would not have been any need for uh, Christian Bond to do the research she did if they had cleaned up the mess in the first place. Mm. It's just that simple. Unfortunately, some people don't want to address, they want to address that. One of the things about the reason why I write, and I've been doing this for probably about 40 years, and it's posted on my website. I love to write film reviews. Okay. I like to write editorials. But here's the problem. Uh, you cannot get mainstream media to give the same attention to Black writers and artists as they do to white artists and writers. So you have a choice. You can either do nothing or, as Louis Farrakhan has said on numerous occasions, do it yourself. So I don't need to have, I don't need to be validated by some uh, white organization because I can read and write as well as anybody else and actually, actually better. And uh, statements that I make, okay, fall under the First Amendment. And again, if someone has a problem with anything that I've said, Tell me where the error is, and I'll correct it. Got gotcha. you. Never done that. Got gotcha. you. I'm gonna switch up again. You have a you're a former human re resource director, and you have extensive knowledge, obviously, on EOC affirmative action and some of the things, uh, so on. And also, in the report you wrote 2019, where you challenge, I guess, the state, city, and county governments from your perspective. Are you challenging some of our institutional thinking about affirmative action, diverse, and so on? Where are we at today from your vantage point? I think you've seen some recent stuff. Where do you think we're at based on your experience? Okay, so let us let me be clear. Uh, when I said 2019, the, the data that I present, the research that I present, it's not mine. Anybody can get it. In fact, the US government has been tracking the status of black people since before, during and after slavery, okay? And so the EO1s, are data that the government compiles on men and women by race, by category. It's been done forever, okay? And so it's, um, back in the day, uh, a person such as myself, we would call that, that's how, you, that's how you measure the status of the plantation, okay? So when I, now let me be a little clear. Plantation economics works this way. Historically, the people that worked in senior management, they were always white, typically white men. Your professionals are typically white men. Clerical, that's typically female, okay? Uh, service workers, that could be, now we might find some blacks, and labor, that's where we're gonna find a lot of blacks and some whites, okay? Okay. Corporations could look, at, they, could take, they, could, they could look at a glance and see exactly where are the people that work for this organization. If people think that things have changed, okay, this is not me saying it. The public and private sector employers in Nebraska said this in the most recent data that in 2019, okay, not one black person or Native American person or Latino person was hired in any senior level management level positions. Okay, so uh, so who am I talking about? I'm talking about the city of Omaha. Don't blame the messenger. You wrote a blistering piece about the empowerment network, their annual state report that they do. You also came back and I think had some other comments and so on. You raised basically call it a clown show, as some call it. Or maybe you didn't call it, but somebody called it know. that. And also my point back to you or my question is, was there any positive things from your vantage point in spite of your critique of them that you think came out of that historical or that 
event that points us on the empirical data you've shared? Here, here's here's the the an objective assessment. Some might think that I have some personal vendetta against the empowerment network. I don't. Okay. Uh, I only look at things um, uh, in a very linear way. Okay. Instinct versus intellect. Uh, emotion versus uh, reason. Okay. And uh, when someone says X and you cannot validate that because they keep moving the goalpost. Okay. Um, there, the 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 Omaha World, Omaha World Herald uh, is the paper of record for Omaha. Okay, they have published on numerous occasions information on the status of Black people. Okay, as has Gallup and other entities. Okay, and so uh, it's interesting. In fact, it's really disappointing when. In order to make your point, you have to cherry pick. You have to. You have to. Well, let's look at this data and let's assess it this way. Okay. Um, the NFL. There are thirty teams, and they all play by the same rules. Okay. So if if the empowerment network or the city of Omaha, they want to say that they've they, they've done X, Y, and Z. Okay. Let's make sure that the lit, that the litmus test is consistent throughout. Right. And therein lies the problem. Right, I got you. By the way, switching up again, you um, you did a blistering critique of the Omaha Star, uh, and I guess you raised some very valid points uh, uh, about how they can improve. From your vantage points, I suspect you've seen subsequent issues. Have there been an improvement by the publisher or the entities who produce that based on your critique? Well, it's, it's not, okay. <laughs> you used the word blistering. I look at it this way, and I've said, uh, the same thing, not just about the star. Okay, that's the thing that it's, it's Omaha World Herald. I I I I don't pick favorites. Okay, <clears throat> when an entity that there was a time, let me look at it, let's look at it this way. There was a time when even uh, broadcast media they would do investigative journalism. They would actually take the time to do research to make sure that your elected officials are doing what they said they're going to do. People like uh, Edward R. Morrow, uh, people like um, Walter Jacobson in Chicago, okay? When was the last time that any of the major television networks in town or the Omaha, or the Omaha World Herald actually assessed the relationship between the city of Omaha and the empowerment network? Are there no other professional people of color that have expertise in all kinds of things that could benefit the entire citizenry. So right. the Omaha Star is not the issue. And uh, let's be consistent here. Be, um, the independent of me, it was the, the North Omaha, some kind of North Omaha organization, they did an assessment of Omaha Star and they said it was not relevant, okay? So how can you be relevant if not, I'm not saying it, my concern about the Omaha Star is that it had data on the website that was anywhere from, gosh, man, six months, even a year old. It's not news. As I said in my editorial, Black people have every right to expect a certain sense of professionalism, just like white people. Right, right. And obviously, you look at some of these entities, they don't have it. Yeah. You're in in um uh, you on your website you have extensive data and information statistics. I know sometimes that's hard to get racial data in apartheid systems where people will hide data. Um, uh, are there other entities in the black community or other repository of information that has similar data that you're aware of uh, that people can look at to see how well we're doing or not well we're doing, or <laughs> well, how good we're doing? Well, it's really easy, Ajama. It's really easy because uh, and I, this is not a negative assessment of of white people or black people, but we're in the information age. If you wanna find out right now, anyone wants to find out right now, the EO ones for, for Wichita, Kansas, go to eo.gov, 
you can't. Just equal opportunity in numbers data is what you're talking about, racial data. Yeah, racial data. Okay. 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 I mean, but as I mentioned before, you can you can go Pew Research, Gallup. Um, uh, I mean, there's so many. Um, uh, gosh, UNO, they do their own independent studies. A lot of organizations, public and private sector, are compiling data and they publish it all the time. Okay. The CDC, okay. Uh, it's an oh, So, Trim, my question is, is everybody local who's doing it? That's what I'm asking. Anybody local well, that you Gallup heard who local. had similar data? Well, Gallup was local. UNO is local. They do it. Okay. And they have virtual data out there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In yeah. fact, in fact, okay. <laughs> You had to I kind of chuckle at this and the uh, the empowerment network, uh, they partnered with, I think it's UNO and their two, 2019 study. And so, uh, so uh, uh, and there's a disclaimer saying that this information is proprietary, cannot be used without prior written consent from the empowerment network or so forth and so on. Well, OK. All right. But here's the deal. Uh, last time I checked. You and know is a public sector entity. Okay. All right. So they could have to show stuff up. They're using taxpayer dollars. That makes sense. So so you can so you can get that information, uh, like it or not, uh, for, the, for the freedom of information request. So um, unless uh, again, if I'm wrong, tell me. Well, they're using composite stuff. They're not using people's names and so on. Uh, switching up again, I know that you talk. Two things come to mind in our community. The two strongest are known entities that deal with race issues. Uh, outside of Latino the Midlands in, in, uh, in terms of South Omaha is the NAACP and the Urban League. How do they rank in the scope of your work? What kind of collaborations have you done with them? And do you interact with those entities at any level? No, and, and let me give you kind of a, 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 a background here. I had been in, in Dallas, I mean, in Denver for 16 years, and also Dallas and Chicago, and in an HR capacity. So now in HR capacity, that means me working as a manager of employment, a director of HR, VP of HR, okay? And in every instance, this is Chicago, Dallas, and Denver, I, uh, because we were an EEO employer, we had to um, convey that we are being uh, sensitive to um, EOC requirements, right? That meant working with organizations such as NAACP and also the Urban League. Almost, I hated to work with, um, the, with the Urban League because uh, they consistently provide what I consider inept talent, um, poorly, poorly trained talent. Are you talking about national, another place, or Omaha? I'm lost here. I'm, I'm talking about Omaha. Omaha. I'm talking around the U.S. I'm I'm being very specific here. I'm talking about okay. Dallas, Denver, and Chicago. What so, about Omaha? Okay. So when I get to Omaha, okay, this is about 2007 or so. The Urban League position uh, director was 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 open. So I said to my dad, "Hey, dad, I could probably clean them up because I know exactly why employers, white owned and controlled employers, don't like to use the Urban League." Because again, I'm the HR, I'm the HR guy that hires people, right? Because um, uh, I know how poorly they're trained, and and they're not trained to actually do the work, the actual work that the employer requires. Uh, and I'm talking about uh, H, uh, high tech environments. Uh, nobody cares about service workers, and no one wants to train people to work. I'm just telling you, they don't want to train. Employers don't want to train. They can put up this facade, but I'm just telling you the real deal someone who did not have any experience whatsoever in actually hiring a diversity of employees. Uh, the former police chief, Warren, he got hired. And my dad said to me, well, Tripp, you know, his sister's on board. <laughs> okay, And that's what Omaha does. That's what Omaha does, okay? And so when you look at the Urban League, Okay, when you look at the NAACP, particularly in the last 15, 20 years, ask yourself independently, just on a, very objectively, what's changed in terms of the social economic status of Black people? What has changed? What have they actually done? Okay. Right. So I'm, don't, don't, again, don't pick on me. Okay, I'm just asking. Okay, so you, we elect a Black president. The wage gap between Black and white people increase, stay the same. Or decrease during Obama's presidency. That's working with the Urban League and NAACP. Did it? What happened? 
Well, and those, actually, are, the, those are the questions we should be asking all the time. We got about five minutes before we open up to the audience. Yeah. I'm going to ask you two last questions if I can. But, yeah, but it actually got worse. That's okay. what happened. Okay, now go ahead. Um, if you had a magic wand in, in light of your writing, your skill set, who you are, and so on, what do you wish for the African American community? What is, what is it something you think we should be about from your vantage point? Now, if you can be brief, because I want to get you one last before we open up to yeah. the audience. Yeah, okay. and my answer is real simple integration without ownership means nothing. If you don't own it, integration is, is, is pointless. And Black people need to own, need to own property. They need to own businesses. Uh, looking to be integrated into white society is ridiculous. It's just, it's just ridiculous. That's not, that, when you look at it historically, okay, every time that occurs, uh, name, a, name a, a huge Black business that was very successful, Motown. Motown's not black owned anymore. Soft Sheen, it's not black owned anymore. Okay, that's what happens. Integration without ownership means nothing. Got you. We uh we're gonna open up, but any any last comments you want to share before we open up Knowledge to the participants? Anything else? Anything else you want to share? Uh, no, I I'll, I'll just I'll just I'll respond to whatever questions anyone might have. Good. Folks, we have pretty much at this point, what I do normally is I provide a series of questions and engage the, the host, I mean, the guest rather, on a number of issues. Then we open it up to the audience to see if they have to say. Cynthia, since the sensor asked us to clarify a little bit more, I guess, the meaning of Wakanda and Jukanda. You alluded to it briefly, but can you really succinct, shop, shop, why Jukanda and Wakanda, the contrast, what that really means? A little bit different angle. The Black Panther story was created by a Jewish man, uh, Stan Lee. Okay. Now, it wasn't necessarily a parody of the actual Black Panther organization, but it just so happens the character is called the Black Panther. And the Black Panther represents a technologically advanced society. But this technologically advanced society that has, uh, that has weaponry that's better than any place else in the world, they could have taken over the world. They could have freed black people from servitude, but they did not. Okay. So gotcha. the correlation is, okay, what if there was a Jukanda of Jewish people who had all this technological um, advances and they could have defeated Hitler? They could have eliminated the, the they could have prevented the Holocaust. But instead of doing that, they just sat by and did nothing. Got you. I understand. Very clear. Good. Now, so so, but here's what the, here's the problem. It's okay to make a to make a movie about black people shuffling and jiving, and and wanting to stay out of the white man's world. That's okay. Okay, but it's not okay to make a movie about a hidden Jewish civilization that did nothing and allow 6 million Jews to die. Gotcha, I understand what you're saying. There's a, another comments, I think, uh, Ewing raises a point, what are some of the solutions you have, I assume, to help the black community? What are, you, what are your, your template for reversing some of the quagmire that you describe in some of your narratives? I'm gonna be very consistent. Integration without ownership means nothing. It just means nothing. Okay, here's a solution. Okay, Omaha Land Bank. There's all this property uh, that's, that's available uh, and it's primarily <laughs> in District 2. Okay. Or North Omaha. But North Omaha, right? Okay. Okay. Here's a novel idea. Why don't Black homeowners in North Omaha form an LLC? Okay. And then use their income as a leveraged buyout to take all that property and then, uh, uh, and then, uh, create this huge residential and commercial smorgasbord of property to benefit Black people. We mean that can't be done. Well, wait a minute now. Didn't the city of Omaha uh, to build uh, I seventy five right through the heart of uh, North Omaha do intimate domain to do and did exactly the same thing? And that's what redlining is all about. Gotcha. But it's okay. But see, but it's okay for them to do it, but it's not okay for black people to do it. Uh, when Senator Chambers correctly 
uh, proposed that OPS be split into three separate school districts because that's actually how it works. That's how, the, in reality, it is. There's the South Omaha, there's the West Omaha, and there's the North Omaha, okay? Julian Bond called my dad and he asked my dad not to support Senator Chambers because uh, uh, in the move to split up OPS. And my dad said no. But because, at, the because, the, at the end of the day, the, the, the divisions didn't happen. We still got the same plantation dysfunctional educational system. We can't get right. data from OPS. So, so it's really kind of a sham today looking at the outcomes. Somebody has another comment here. Dennis Walmart raised the issue about Lamar Star starting to build a museum on behalf of Mildred Brown, but he also raised the issues. We don't really uh, a museum. We don't really need a museum. We need manufacturing and jobs and employment. How do you react to something like that? Well, okay. Uh, we need another museum. Um, <laughs> we don't need another. Museum. What? What? I thought there was one, a black museum in Omaha, the Midlands. What is the Midlands? I don't know what it's called now. Um, it's called the Black Museum. Yeah, the Black Museum. You know, okay. Um, uh, that's plenty. Okay. Uh, the uh, I you're, what you just observed uh, is is a higher protocol. The uh, the unemployment rate for Black people in Omaha has always been higher than the unemployment rate every everywhere else in Omaha. So it's frankly the focus should be on not show and tell but pr productivity other questions other questions other comments other feedback and we've got a number of people here who may want to raise some comments directly you can speak open your mic up and talk directly to trip he's open to it well um was it land bank just hired a black woman uh, race is not the issue some some people may think that um uh, my commentaries are this pro-black militant kind of thing. No, not at all. Uh, facts are facts. It, it, it's facts are facts. Okay. Uh, you said earlier, Ajamal, about freedom um, in the media, being able to, there seems to be an absence of that, of uh, telling the truth. When Tariq al I was, when we were at CTI, Tariq al came to me and he said, Trip, can you play this video? And it was about uh, Robert, uh, what's his, Robert, uh, when he was beaten out in front of, of Creighton? Wagner, right, I ain't talking about. Robert Wagner, yeah. Right. And I, I said, absolutely. There is a need for that kind of immediacy for Black people. And we don't have it, obviously. We don't have it, okay? And so uh, you, you asked me a question, so what is the Black news perspective about? Okay, well, here's what the Black News Perspective.com is about. Okay, um, uh, Cheryl Weston and I created the website for a simple reason to tell news from a Black perspective right. and, to, and to do it as promptly as possible. And so, uh, for example, the thing that's going on now with a 14 year old, uh, I don't know what the deal is now. Is it, is it a manslaughter? I don't, I don't know, but whatever it is, there should be a method for Black people in the normal hall to be able to address their concerns as promptly as possible. In the media. Here's what we know at this point. In the absence of a coordinated effort from the Omaha Star, which I proposed, but they ignored, they didn't want to do it, um, and, and some radio entities uh, in Omaha, there could be a vibrancy that was lost when the city of Omaha and Cox Communication shut down community telecasts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Some people said, oh, well, John Houston said in the reader, he said, well, the family business, uh, community telecast. And I, I told John, it's not a family business at all. It never was. Okay. Mm. okay. Here's, here is the specifics about, um, and the reason why Omaha really should be ashamed of itself. In the United States, typically a community access channel is going to get less than 5% of the cable subscribers audience. But community telecast, because we were very robust in our programming, uh, we were getting anywhere from 12 to 22% of Cox's audience, okay? That's phenomenal, okay? So why are they cutting it out there? Well, uh, 
uh, Tom Mumgard said, well, Trip, you had, you know, people are tired of the programming you had, the programming you had on there. And, uh, you know, that Who's this Tom guy you're talking about? This Mumgard? Tom Mumgard, deputy city attorney. Got you. So I'm in the city. Okay. So the city had a role in getting rid of the challenge. Absolutely. Okay. And so here's the deal. Community, cal community telecast, we had no authority who could be on the air. Period. We had, we, we released the time on a first come, first serve basis. About 25% of our content was religious. Another 25% was approximately Latino. Another 25% was just all over the board. Okay. But we had a program called Senator Ernie Chambers that people didn't like. Certain people didn't like. Okay. For example, when Lee Terry said to me, Trip, can a white guy have a chance have a program on your channel? And I looked, and he was congressman at that point. I said, like I'm gonna tell a white man who's a US congressman that he can't have a program. <laughs> Come on, man. Okay. And Jim Esch or Susan Smith. Okay. Um, so in other words, you're open to all these different personalities, but they need to also and, and reciprocate that, back to black folks. Yeah, yeah. If that's what you want. You want that. Okay. Uh, it's unfortunate that people who ultimately make the decisions, they're, they don't practice the egalitarian principles they preach. And so I, I go back to the city of Omaha, okay? I go back to Douglas County. I go well, back all, to- All of these entities are like that. You know, they're racist, they elitist, they lack the lack of participation. By the way, I've said many times, the city's 33% or more, 35 people of color, but you would never know that going to city hall, county government, state government, so on. I'm gonna switch up real quick and ask you, I saw that of uh, Herb uh, Union, he raised the issue, it's officially called the Great Plains Black History Museum. I just call it the Black Museum, yeah, yeah. you know, where we just referred to, but yeah. he gave the official title uh, of that, because again, I misspoke and just called it the Black Museum, and it's got a long official title yeah. uh, that we well, need to acknowledge, okay? Why do things still look the same? Right, or why do the demographics look like they do? Okay, good. Fair so, game, so, so, fair so, so, question. question. The right. and, and again, who can answer that? I mean, we got a lot of quiet folks on the set. Other feedback, other reactions. Trip is in the house. Trip Reynolds here throwing out some heavy light. Other feedback. Some some have said that I have a a, uh, a negative viewpoint of of religion, particularly you know black ministries and such. I don't. I have a problem with hypocrisy. <laughs> People will say one thing and do something else. Oh, wait, oh, the way you said that, are you just saying in a cryptic way that black religious people or religious folks who are black are hypocrites? Is that what you're basically saying? I'll say it again. I have a problem, problem with hypocrisy. I don't care who it is, whether you're black or white. I have a problem with hypocrisy, okay? Let's switch gears here for a second, okay? This is what I mean by hypocrisy. So I'm HR director, I'm actually a VP of HR for credit union in, 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 uh, in, in Denver. And uh, an employee uh, was out of balance. The employee had been warned on numerous occasions. If if she or he was out of balance again, they're at risk for being terminated. Okay. The employee was out of balance again. So you know what I did with the employee? Guess. What do you think, Ajima? What I did with the, what did I do with the employee? I'm not sure. I wasn't there. Believe me, give me. I'm not good at guessing. I'll tell you, tell you what I did. I fired the employee for failure to perform. That simple. Employee is out of bounds. Three thousand dollars. I fired the employee for failure to perform. Okay, it's at will employment. That's what I did. I had another employee who uh, said that said to me, a black male employee. The employee that Frank. Uh, I mean, I didn't make it white blouse. A black employee said to me, uh, "Hey, Trip, you, uh, I'm the only one here who has a degree." And, 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 and they're discriminating against me and, and, and they won't promote me. So I said to this black male employee, I said, you're not here to be black. You're here to be a teller. And as a teller, you are $5,000 out of bounds and you have a terrible attendance record. So understand me. If there's any merit to your concerns about discrimination, I'll act on those, make no mistake. But you're not here to be black. You're here to do the job. And you're not doing the job. So if you come to work late again late, I'm going to terminate you. If you're out of balance again, I'm going to terminate you. Do you understand me? Trip, he goes, Trip, you don't understand. No, do you understand me? Okay. Now watch how this relates to John Ewing. So John Ewing is out of balance. That's what it was. Means and means and means of dollars. Okay. Do you really think that 
an employee working at Walmart who's out of balance would be given, well, you know, he that say the employee, she or he, they mistakenly put the wrong code into the cash register. And that's why the amount was coming up incorrect. Mm. Okay. No. Okay. So let's play fair. Let's be well, and, you know, I know I know it's a little bit more to the story just from what I read, but we can come back to it a little bit later. I'm gonna switch up. Somebody's got uh something here. They talked about the land bank. Uh, was fired. The last one was by unanimous vote. I know we just recently, the woman who was hired working for the Chamber of Commerce was African American, disappeared after 11 months. There was a report about that. Again, she was more of a director of diversity. Again, the, the news media played that a little bit different. I haven't heard a lot of outcry from the community of color who, again, supported her maybe employment. But uh, you're arguing a different point that someone has to do not with just race, but people have been competent and we sometimes hide behind race the way you alluded to instead of just holding ourselves feet to the fire like we do anyone else. But the other it's people not- would argue there are many white folks who are incompetent. I saw many of them in county and city government. And again, there are many people I've written to in the public schools who will not respond to my letters or basic grammatical, simple letters that says, is this the question? Answer this question, they won't do it. So I'm a little kind of convoluted. I'm gonna be careful yeah. that we're not picking on black folks only here. Yeah, and, and I agree with you. I agree with you, which is why, which is why uh, you'll find in my editorials that I don't play favorites. For example, when Governor Ricketts was preparing uh, this task force for trade, international trade, no one on his task force was a person of color. And he's going to do to try to do trade in places like Southeast Asia. Nebraska received a lot of Southeast Asians from, from during in, in the 70s from Vietnam. My guess is that people who still have relatives in Vietnam that are in Nebraska probably have a greater affinity and language skills to talking with someone who is in Southeast Asia. Right. But no, my criticisms, if you will, of the chamber's uh, former uh, president CEO is no different than my assessment of Ricketts. I'm real consistent in this regard. By the, the way, his, his head of his economic development is an African-American man. He didn't take him along with him. Do you know about that? Who, Ricketts? Yeah, he had, was, was, isn't there an African-American guy who's the head of the economic development? I've seen his picture in the Omaha Star. He's in, he was in the previous administration, Ricketts, and the new governor just came to continue his employment. So well, he was he on the trip. Well, here's the deal. In Ricketts' cabinet, when I wrote my editorial, there was only one person of color on his cabinet. It was a black woman, and she was over DHHS. Right, Health and Human Services. Okay. The other person probably wasn't there is what you just said. Okay, got yeah. you. It's consistent with, um, unfortunately, in Nebraska, that people of color and women are excluded from the process. Okay. Again, I, I go back to the EO ones in Nebraska. Um, uh, for all jobs that pay over public plus such jobs that pay over seventy thousand dollars a year, uh, ninety. Five percent of those jobs, the incumbents are white men and women. But of that 95 percent, 88 percent are white men. And so about 11 percent are white women, which means what? Which means white women are not even considered in the same equitable fashion as white men for jobs to pay over $7,000 a year in Nebraska. What I would encourage people to do is uh, if someone has concerns or questions about uh, anything that I write, do what I do. Just look up the facts. All right, a rebuttal if they disagree. We got about 10 minutes left in the program. I know the audience has been somewhat quiet. Any feedback, any reactions uh, to something that Trevor have said or I've said or whatever, things you want to raise related to this program today? No, I'm saying anybody else. Oh, I know anybody. We got some people who don't even comment, but they're quiet today. I guess they're sitting here listening to you astutely and attentively and all those other things. So I want to give people to weigh in uh, to pick your brain or to challenge you or to have a little rebuttal if need be, you know? You know, common sense is is an unfortunate reality that people may not want to embrace, to to embrace, but uh, 
the simplicity of common sense should be used to provide guidance on how to interact in both business and politics, uh, racially. Um, uh, for uh, some people think race should be the dominant issue and I think it should not be. Uh, I think the dominant issue should be one for fairness and equity. Uh, for anyone to think that all white people are bad, that all white people are evil, that in itself is evil. That is wrong. That is stupid. There's, a, there's, just, there's millions and millions of good white people out there. Okay. What's also true is that uh, historically, when you look at the origins of this, of this nation, the people who ultimately make the the final decision, the elite and powerful in almost all aspects, those are all white, typically white men. And they have not practiced the egalitarian principles that they preach. That's the problem. Because there's a lot of, of, of good white people who are not industry leaders, who are not business leaders. And they are treated no differently then in some cases, some black people. Efforts that Senator Chambers made to provide some assistance to poor white farmers in Western Nebraska, that's ignored, mm -hmm. okay? It should not be. I had a conversation with Russell Means before he died and uh, talking about airing some programs on community telecasts uh, for the Republic of Lakota. And he was in agreement with that. Um, Russell Means, has, you can find the videos out there. Russell Means, who is a, a staunch advocate for Native American rights, Russell Means had issues with Black people because Black people, in so many instances, did the same kinds of things to Native Americans that white people did. If you say you're going to be fair and just and, and embrace equality, then practice what you preach. And uh, my, my most recent editorial, it's about uh, how to end the war in Ukraine. What we won't see is people who say that they believe that thou shalt not kill. And I'm talking about Jews and Christians and Muslims. They say thou shalt not kill. Okay? If you really believe that, then get over there and stop the war in Ukraine. Stop the war in Sudan. Stop all these killings. But they won't do that. That's the hypocrisy that I have a problem with. We're, we're got down probably about seven minutes. So there's a couple of comments that came in through the chat. One is that, can you define a little bit more who are the black elites in Omaha and are there a few who own the business, lots of properties, whatever their homes, vacation homes, yachts, whatever. But can you pinpoint yeah. who what you not, the black elites? Yeah, it's not for me to define the black elites, okay? The black elites are defined by white people. And it's always been that way. How do you know? Because... Um, when the, it's either going to be a mayor or a governor or president of the United States, they, do, they have these cattle calls. They want to be seen with people they think are movers and shakers in the Black community. The, the picture of, of, of Ricketts with Johnny Rogers and so forth and so on, that's who the Black elite are. White people have identified those people. Wait, um, wait, hold on, you lost me. You're saying that <laughs> we defy Black elites by the way, white people pick them out. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Okay, gotcha. Okay, that's that's a different kind of a concept. Well, okay. Well, by the way, we only got a few minutes, but did somebody else throw out the I point, should, uh, okay. ask a question? Yeah. What is your thoughts on the Empowerment Network? You talked a little bit about it, but they yeah, came okay. late and it says okay. it relates to this program. But can you be very, very succinct about what you think of the Empowerment Network? In yeah. A okay. Because it relates to the Black elite. The city of Omaha consistently has nurtured relationships with members of the empowerment network more than any other group or individuals in Omaha. They therefore are the black elite. Okay. It's not me saying it. To whom did the mayor decide to be her chief of staff? To whom is the city of Omaha embracing as a showcase for improvement in North Omaha, the Empowerment Network. I, I, got, I got your picture, you're very clear. We only got about five minutes left, I wanna to get to the valuation. 
by the way, you started something called the, the Black News Perspective. Really briefly, how, what is that about? Are you doing that? What does that mean? And how can somebody hook up okay. with you on that program? Simply put, there should be an outlet for Black people to showcase what's good or what's bad or what's ugly. And, and to do so in a way that's not confined or massaged by mainstream white-owned media. We have nothing against white-owned media. And in some cases, uh, it would be a good thing, frankly, to embrace content from external sources. And we would be inclined to do so. Midland's Business Journal, and the Omaha, um, Omaha World Herald, they routinely showcase white men and women that are promoted in jobs, and increase their market share. How often do you see a, a black person featured in the Midlands Business Journal? Never. Wow, oh, how, that's part of it. How, how often do you see the, the, black, the Midlands Business Journal, they have editorials from conservatives, but sometimes liberals. How often do you see conservative editorials from people of color in the Omaha uh, World Herald. You don't. Uh, my olive branch is simply to this. If there's a 15 year old kid in Omaha who, who wants to say something about whatever, send it to me, <laughs> okay? Of course, we, don't, we won't publish anything that violates anybody's copyright. We're not gonna put up their pornography or anything like that. Uh, we're not gonna libel and slander anybody. But there should be a way for, uh, for any person of, of color, really, to be able to say, uh, this is what's good, or this is what's bad, and this is what's really ugly. ugly. And that's what we want to do. Good. Sure, we're down to the last minute or so, but if somebody wanted to catch up with your contact, you know, how would they best catch up or contact you or in terms of your website or whatever? How would they catch up with you? But uh, just use trip at the Black News perspective.com very direct trip at the black news perspective.com and and at, at any time if somebody wants to respond to any of my editorials uh, at trip poetry.com it's uh, trip.reynolds at yahoo.com i am not social advocate uh, some may think that i am but i'm not what i am is a person who believes in facts i'm a person who believes in the truth uh, I'm a person who does not like to see someone when there's clear evidence that to assail that person is really inappropriate and it's deceitful. Good. Well, Tripp, we're down to the last minute. I really thank you for being on the program today, uh, the feedback you provided, and hopefully we'll get a chance to repeat and talk about some of these issues down the road. But really appreciate you being here today. Uh, and uh, for our participants today, we have an evaluation form you can fill out. And also we are looking to get people who can provide feedback to some of our uh, survey questions and we're looking to find people who might volunteer, give us suggestions for future programs. So feel free to catch up with us at some point, go to our website. And again, let us know if you wanna play a little bit more of an active role in the things we do with moving Omaha for race, equity in Omaha here. So appreciate you being here today. As we always in our program, may the force be with you. And Barocco.